introduce you briefly, uh, Jeremy. Uh, so today uh, we have uh, Jeremy from um, Electrical Engineering of uh, National Tsinghua University at Taiwan with us. Uh, thank you again, Jeremy, jo for joining us. Uh, Jeremy uh, got his BS and PhD degrees both from University of Southern California in 2007 and 2012. I think, uh, I mean, my first meeting with Jeremy was at, in uh, 2012 when I was in sabbatical at USC. Uh, actually, we got in uh, contact. Uh, so his research interests uh, lay in the speech and language processing, effective computing, uh, behavioral signal processing, and health analytics. Uh, he's uh, very basically active participant uh, and volunteer of the uh, speech and language technology uh, community, um, and he is also a well recipient of several awards including Young, Young Innovator Award, uh, Young Electrical Engineering Award, Young Researcher Award, and uh, NTHU Industry Collaboration Excellence Award in 2021, and also the Most Future Tech Breakthrough Award in 2018 and 19. So it is, again, uh, a pleasure to have you uh, today, Jeremy. Uh, let me leave the floor to your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Engine. It's been a while. Hopefully, we get to meet in person. Okay. So yeah. uh, let me. Yeah. So I'll start my uh, my talk. Uh, so the talk will be centered around effective speech modeling analysis. You know, mostly concentrated from three different aspects. I think you know that will push the effective computing or effective speech computing computing of forward robustness, generalization, and usability. I'll talk about each one of them sort of briefly and quickly, and some of the highlights of our recent work uh, in this domain. Uh, again, yes, a little bit of background myself. I think uh, it's well introduced. So, you know, I got my PhD, uh, WE PhD at University of Southern California. My research interests, again, affect computing, speech language, health analytics, and sort of generally using machine learning uh, approaches to deal with all these issues. So, again, since the topic is around uh, emotional recognition, just a brief um, sort of uh, intro on, on, on industry trend, right? So, the global emotion detection recognition market is forecast to grow at, you know, 12.9%. Right now, 2020, the overall market size is around 23.6 billion. We're forecasting it to uh, be 43.3 billion in 2027. And, of course, because of the effect computing technology, it's sort of underneath a lot of the user-centric services technology. Technology, you know, from healthcare, customer service, smart home, human computer interaction, you can see that emotional recognition or emotion sort of this kind of detection techniques can uh, play a major role in this in this uh, in this uh, every application domain. And in fact, the Gartner hype cycle for 2022, the emerging technology, you see the uh, in the marketing context, emotion AI is still growing. You know, probably fast growing five to ten years to plateau. Different kind of context for African company I see in the past Gartner hype cycle in 2019. I also see a version of Emotion AI. I think uh, also 2020, 2019, 2017. Okay, 2017, I also see another one also in the Gartner hype cycle for general athletic computing technology. So I think different segments of emotion AI, you know, has been, you know, point out as one of the key technology, emerging technologies for general uh, sort of uh, emotion uh, based services. And I think it's still fast growing. So I think that's industry size. So what have we done academically? You know, this today I'm going to talk mostly on this aspect, especially in terms of uh, computing uh, emotion from speech. Actually, you know, a good summary is so in the back in 2014, uh, there's a there's a uh, it's at the end of my PhD time, uh, there's a Oxford handbook on athletic computing. I was it was actually released in 2014. One of the chapters I wrote um, on speech and athletic computing. At that time, there are actually three major components that could summarize the whole field, right? One is understanding how we humans produce emotion, speech, uh, speech emotion, that uh, speech uh, uh, produce a speech production that has emotion modulation with it. So sort sort of a scientific underpinning of how we modulate our vocal tract and so on uh, in response how our internal states are. 
you know, and then, you know, stores and then in the single processing domains, we you know, take those acoustic sounds and do all kinds of analysis from feature space and so on, and actually be able to understand, you know, pitch variability uh, in terms of emotion, you know, intensity variability, uh, some, you know, spectral uh, modulations uh, because of the emotion. Then, of course, at that time, you know, uh, speech-based recognition based on machine learning approaches uh, has been developed. Uh, and slowly, of course, a lot of them are, are built upon deep learning uh, type of algorithm. That's sort of back in 2014, where it's coming from a scientific understanding to you know, signal-derived measures, then actually feed that signal-derived measure into uh, ML-based uh, approaches for recognition. Now, in 2021, just last year, I wrote another one in uh, actual signal processing magazines for deep representation learning for athletic speech analysis and, model and processing. Again, this is still about speech motion recognition and modeling. Uh, I've we'll summarized this uh, with Carlos, you know, three key modeling challenges uh, for the years to come and for sort of, sort of wrap up what has happened, basically on three aspects. You know, one is acquisition. Uh, a lot of techniques are being developed to actually make sure uh, FX speech analysis are robust across different uh, get different contexts, you know, different acquisition Jeremy, devices. Jeremy, sorry for interrupting. No um, problem. So one of the audience is asking if we could go into the presentation mode. So oh, okay. now we can see the next slide. Like this, right? Yes, much better. Okay, Thank cool. You. Sorry about that. Uh, all right, so uh, moving on. <laughs> so it's three are modeling, uh, three modeling challenges for a speech effective analysis. No one is acquisition, basically robust against different devices and so on. Uh, second is generalization across different contexts. You know, the, the applicational context, uh, you know, different uh, domains, you know, uh, friends talking, you know, family talking, uh, in educational setting, all these things should have been generalized uh, using uh, different kinds of approaches. Last one is more recent, it's on a user perspective. You know, when we actually deploy FI speech modeling or techni technologies, some of the issues around privacy, uh, ethical concern, fairness, all these things are becoming the next step issues when these kind of robust, generalizable uh, speech and motion recognition techniques are being deployed in the wild, in the, into, into our life, and actually fundamentally impact users. Uh, and several issues around there uh, will be discussed. Okay, so I would, I would call this sort of into life emotion AI technology under uh, three different uh, sort of modeling challenges. Uh, one is you know, uh, robustness, handle signal heter heterogeneity, and the label robustness, you know, every definitions of emotion uh, uh, using the different kind of label across different contexts. So label itself, uh, how do we uh, uh, make sure there's less noise in terms of labeling approaches, you know, this is also part of the robustness. I always, always tell uh, people that, you know, emotional recognition plays a very important uh, and a unique angle where it's not just that signals are, are variable, uh, it's actually the labeling itself can create noise. The variability in the labeling, the variability in the people defining, say, angry. Okay, everybody define angry in a little bit different way. Everybody define business activation in a really different way. Uh, people who rate it are also going to introduce a little bit different noise into this thing. How do we make sure our kind of methodology are also robust against this? It's also, also very important. Generalization, uh, like I said, do it across different contexts, meaning, you know, some of our feature representation should be generalizable across domain, across language, across culture. Uh, the same happens for across context level definitions. How can we make sure when you know we you know, Chinese uh, Chinese people say anger is the same thing as Europeans say anger, maybe they're different. Okay, how do we make sure that's kind of generalizable across context in a way we can deploy uh, speech recognition, uh, speech motion recognition uh, techniques sort of in a fast and robust manner. Last one is usability, right? In terms of ethics, fairness, inclusivity, privacy. How do we do it against privacy and malicious tech? So I think these lay out the three major directions of research in speech emotional recognition on some of technological development. Okay, so like I said, each of which uh, deep learning algorithm could facilitate that kind of technological advancement. I'll talk about uh, several of our recent work on uh, specific addressing each one of these uh, directions. The first one is robustness. Right? Robustness here we say against changing in the test definition. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so recent publication we call uh, in transaction athletic computing, and in role to verify approach for cross test and seeing emotion class recognition. So again, generally, okay, uh, 
when you design a motion recognition system, you say, okay, I have, you know, a couple of predefined classes, you know, angry, happy, sad, and neutral, and you train your system and, and you don't and you do it. Okay. When you're faced with a new system, okay, sorry, when you're faced with a new test definition, meaning uh, when you originally want to do this four class emotion recognition now become uh, just frustration detection. Okay, you no longer care about four different emotion classes under the same context. Now, what would be done? Usually what could be done is let's say, let's recollect data, retrain our system, right? Just to, you know, re rebuild the system by collecting more frustration and then build a frustration detection. Okay, but that way it's very costly. It's very inconvenient. Okay, uh, every time you face a new task, even within the under the same uh, uh, in their in application settings, say call, uh, call, call centers, you know, originally one of four emotion classes suddenly become frustration detection. In the next few months, maybe the company wants to do happy detection. Every time you have a change of this labeling in a way that includes a label lesson scene. Okay, how do we deal with this issue uh, algorithmically so that we can handle this quick? And we, we term this problem as quash task emotion recognition. Okay, and a lot of previous work can't really handle this kind of problem efficiently. A lot of time, uh, many works deal with transfer learning, meaning uh, in call center, I have four emotion classes. I'm gonna use it in, in home, okay? There is a domain mismatch. I'm gonna try to transfer between them. Or we have a, you know, a, a system where, you know, uh, assuming you do some kind of few shot learning, okay? you collect a few samples, you retrain a system in a complex manner, and then you deal with this uh, new unseen emotion classes detection problem. But a lot of this kind of uh, problem aren't able to handle this uh, issue quickly. Okay, transfer learning needs to retrain, retune the model. You wanna do data collection, it becomes very time consuming. And a lot of times, you know, you have pre-trained model that can't work. So our approach is a enroll to verify approach that's kind of inspired by the uh, speaker identification, a verification approach that enables this cross-test emotion recognition without any model retraining. Okay, I'll talk about this approach soon. So let's uh, look at the database that we concentrate on. We use two different databases. One is IEMOCAP, you know, another one is MALD. Both are very popular speech and motion recognition data sets. We assume originally the system are set up to recognize four emotion, so happy, happy, angry, happy, sad, neutral. And now we have you know, newly defined task, say frustration we want to detect or a newly defined task, disgust or fear or surprise detection I wanna do for any of the database. So we use this, we call it emotion, uh, enroll to verify approach. So the idea is pretty simple. One is first you build a emotion prototype in, encoder using the four emotion classes. And then if you have a new system, a uh, new classes that you wanna recognize, you basically took a few of those samples and you enrolled it to derive an embeddings. And once you have an embeddings, okay, then that embedding represent a new and seen classes. Then what you need to do is just to measure the embedding distance as a way to do recognition. I'll go into each step quickly. So again, you can build what we call an emotion prototype encoder. Okay, this emotion prototype I built upon, you know, say four basic emotion, angry, happy, sad, and neutral. So in this particular work, okay, uh, we extract wave to vec features. We use a GRU and take, uh, take those uh, GRUs into uh, a into a transformer-like style. So you have this, this uh, positional encoding. So once extract this embeddings and we train it using not just the simple cross entropy loss and also this uh, negative angular margin prototypical loss. Okay, trying to build a space of a label. Okay, using this embeddings. Okay, so this pro prototype space. Okay, some specific here we, we can uh, uh, do this thing. So, uh, instead of just you know, running the system build a cross entropy loss, you do this angular margin political loss. And then we enforce a negative margin, okay, across different classes. Uh, the reason is because uh, when you have a positive margin, uh, a positive angular margin loss, uh, uh, this create in the cosine space, each of the classes has a sort of margin in between each of the classes. That creates a, a, a more of a, a, a strict uh, separation between classes. But we're here, we're doing emotion recognition, right? We're doing an emotion uh, prototype, all these angry, happy, and sad, neutral. These kind of categorical labels, they naturally seem to have a subjectivity between them. So instead of using a positive angular margin loss, we use a negative angular margin loss so that 
be penalized for over uh, overfitting or over overlapping. Okay, uh, in, uh, over over sort of stringent uh, uh, class separation between the classes to ensure we have actually a robust, more uh, a prototypical uh, uh, emotion basis that's been built. Okay, once we have that. What we need to do is take a new unseen emotion and enroll it. Okay, so we build a four emotion prototypical network that can be used to derive embeddings. Now there's a new emotion that comes in. We wanna we wanna recognize. We can take those emotion, a few samples of them, enroll using this prototypical network, extract the embeddings. Okay. Now we can use that embedding directly. Okay, for recognition now on. Okay, so there's no retraining nothing has happened. We just basically take a prototypical network, train it using negative, negative angular margin loss for a new emotion class, in this case, a frustration versus neutral. We take, say, a couple of their sentences, enroll it to extract the embeddings, and then you just simply, when you add inference, just verify it. Okay, you know, you do a dot product between the new incoming uh, utterances to uh, this uh, 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 patterns, uh, these sort of prototypes of newly enrolled emotions, and then find you know which one is closest. Okay, if it's closest to emotion two, then check mark. Okay, if it's closest to emotion one, let's check mark. Okay, so you just compare and find the one that's similar. So again, I want to rephrase this uh, approach. There's no retraining that needs to happen in terms of actually working on a new test definition. Okay, new label. Okay, nothing has happened. We, it's not few shot learning. We had to retrain the model. Uh, it's not transfer learning. We don't have to refine tune the model. We're basically saying let's build a prototypical network, okay, a prototypical emotion basis using angry, happy, sad, neutral. Once that's built with this angular margin loss and the cross entropy loss, then we use that network to extract embedding for a new task. Once that embedding is extract, then you just need to do dot product to do emotion verification that process need not to be any uh, training that can be that needs to be done let's look at our results we can see that you know uh the the four <coughs> prior means you know uh means we can train the system using uh the the fully annotated data you know say if we have two thousand sentences in the IMO cap for frustration meaning we just train a system using that full two thousand sentences okay then the rest of them are different ways that we can do this uh, embedding network and then do uh, enroll and verify. NNMP is our framework. Uh, so this enroll to verify approach using this uh, NAMP loss achieves the best overall UAR at 71%, which is comparable to the model for retraining over 2000 sentences. Here's no retraining that has to be done. You just need to build a basis network enrolled it, verified it. Okay, the approach is very similar to almost the, the results that the upper bound result of using the entire data set. And then, you know, we see that the negative margin is important. Okay, but if you don't use the negative margin, the accuracy actually drops a little. You actually build a non a enough robust uh, basis to begin with. Okay, so uh, by having that as a beginning, uh, 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 negative margin was important to do, uh, to build our basis, uh, basis, emotion basis to derive the embeddings. Okay, we also see that the performance uh, uh, as, a fun as a function number of enrolled samples, say, you know, 10 samples will actually be enough. Okay, so we need to say, originally it's for emotion class now become frustration. We need 10 samples of frustration. Enroll it becomes our embeddings and then do uh, uh, verification. And we also see that by enrolling uh, those samples that have high confidence, the high confidence meaning the annotator intervaluator agreement are higher for those samples. For those high confidence samples, if we could enroll those, it's actually better for our network than to enroll those that have you know, less uh, uh, agreement. So again, let's, let's summarize the first work, right? And moving on to the second word. The first one, right? We robust against different test definition. No retraining has to be done. Uh, simply build a prototype network, train it, and then not train it, and then just do a dot product and you're done. And second, the generalization. Okay, generalization issue often talks about cross domain generalization. Here, I want to propose an approach. But generalization usually in the cross domain speech recognition, a lot of time people are done in a way that's basically doing, doing say, a domain matching, right? Feature matching, feature distribution matching, uh, and all this sort of stuff. Uh, in our cases, we actually use an augmentation strategy. 
to phase A, for example, instead of directly matching on feature, we just say, no, if you are transferring from A to B, let's try to augment the A with several features of B. Okay, then just train our system on A. Then we directly do a, a supervised uh, emotion recognition on B directly. Okay, so how do we do this efficiently? Okay, so we don't have to worry about, you know, feature space need to match or not. We just need to generate some of the fake features. Okay augment the original source data sets, train our system that way, okay? And then here we propose a framework that can do a many to one, meaning we can use multiple source corpus, okay? All of them could be augmented with the targets, target data. And then, you know, we generate those samples and then train it all together, okay? So essentially you, you have one single final augmented data sets uh, that, that can train with labels and then directly using on the one that has no labels. Okay, we call this, uh, uh, we call this uh, augmentation uh, strategy for unsupervised emotion recognition uh, in the cross database setting. So we have two databases using our source, iMocap and VM. These are two different databases, uh, German, English. Okay, the target databases is a podcast, uh, recent podcast MSP databases. Uh, so these are the two uh, uh, sources where we're going to train our emotion recognition on and test it directly on this MSP podcast. Our framework essentially is built upon a uh, cycle game structure. Okay, so the idea is very simple. We want to generate a sample that's similar to target. Okay, uh, so we use a cycle game as our basis. Okay, so this is a source to target domain adaptation. So these two losses are very standard in cycle game, right? Cyclic loss and identity loss. Okay, so we also add the, what's, what's, what's the novelty point here, since you have multiple corpus, so each corpus we can do this cycle game, but how do we generate the target sample, uh, the, the fake sample, that fake samples is a weighted combination between two sources. Okay, now how do we weight the combination between two sources? We can have it learn that attention directly. Okay, we use a, we call it corpus aware attention. So we have a cycle game that's trying to generate target corpus aware samples in a way that samples being generated as a as a weighted summations of those samples of this of this generated samples right this weight is attention weighting okay it's a attention weighting between two sources so now we have this corpus aware attention that actually learns to summarize how we can leverage each source's samples each source's databases join it together with the target domain data distribution to, re to regenerate, we call it target aware multi-source uh, uh, fake samples. And now when that's all augmented, then we can use it to do uh, uh, model training. Okay, so anyway, so uh, we also uh, make sure, you know, uh, except for that corpus aware attention, we also have this, we call emotion consistency loss. Okay, that means the source emotion through this augmentation process, the, the, the label should re remain the same. So the whole augmentation network is trained using a standard psych, uh, cycle loss, or uh, cycle, uh, cycle gain loss, cyclic loss, identity loss, a gain loss, and an emotion loss. Okay, so all together to train this uh, uh, thing. Okay, so in the augmentation strategy, right, once we have this attention, right, we have corpus of attention derived from a source, and the target, then we can synthesize the target features, the target labels, then do a data augmentation. Then we train a single uh, speech uh, emotion recognition re network with multi-source corpus data. Okay, once that's done, you can apply it directly to the target. So these are some of our results. Okay, so again, we compare to all different kinds of cross corpus, uh, cross corpus method, you know, um, you know, autoencoder base that fits the, 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 the data distribution matching, a simple cycle game uh, without any emotion consistent loss or the uh, or, or cross cor or corpus aware attention. And CC emo again is another approach that's been proposed that's ensure the emotion consistency, but doesn't have this corpus aware attention. Uh, anyway, so these are different approaches. This is the one that we're pro uh, uh, achieve. So basically our proposed method achieved the best overall performance against all baseline uh, unsupervised transfer learning techniques on um, both arousal and valence three-state recognition task. Okay, so uh, results are, 
uh, on balance, even surpass the upper bound of the target data sets that train within only that target data sets, but actually augmented more data using the cycle gain and train it uh, uh, to do this emotion recognition on balance, even better than training on target only data sets for balance dimension. Okay, so uh, again, we also can do some ablation study. Okay, so I uh, wanna see whether is the corpus aware attention that helps or is the uh, uh, emotion constraint that we forces the, uh, the sample that go from source to target and come back, they need to maintain the same emotion state, uh, state whether, the, whether which constraint helps the most. It seems like this uh, corpus aware attention uh, really helps improving arousal and then balance a little bit. Emotion consistently loss also helps a little bit. Compared to most recent state of the art, this cross domain uh, unsupervised transfer techniques are approaches uh, improves mostly in the middle range. Okay, so meaning uh, for classes that's that's middle, uh, low, mid, high, the middle uh, classes are the ones that improves the most compared to loss and, and high. If you see the feature distribution, okay, after this kind of uh, thing, uh, the top ones are the, the recent state of the art, the bottom ones are the one that we use this. So once you augment the data, right? So we can look at the feature space, plot them. Okay, we can see that the, the, the two corpus are gonna be uh, matched much closer, okay, on the same space uh, than, than the ones that before, right? Here's one that you also uh, kind of sort of, the blue and the, the, the light blues and the dark blues are two different corpuses. And then you see the lower one actually has, these two corpuses actually aligns better on this feature space. Okay, and then our approach is simple. We can extend it, this approach to multiple sources, right? Because the way to integrate multiple sources is through the use of attention mechanism, right? So once we can extend it to two source corpus, we can extend to three source corpus. It's the same thing, okay? Now we just need to have attention that's actually becomes a weighted sum between the three source corpus to generate that target synthetic augmentation data. Okay, so we also show that this approach can easily be extended to using multiple source. And, and why I think this is important because in the old previous um, uh, cross corpus emotion recognition task is always one-to-one. -one. Okay, when we deal with multiple to one, there's an issue because every such databases are so unique in itself. When we do this cross corpus training, uh, the best people can handle is from A to B, okay. Now, if we have, now, given in, in this current era, we have A, B, C, D, E, all these kind of different source corpus that's already generated, but each one of them has different context. You know, if you work out them in a pairwise manner, it actually becomes very difficult to uh, train a systematic system, and it also becomes very cumbersome. Okay? So if you actually integrate the generation of augmented data sets using a attention corpus aware attention mechanism and summarize all these multiple source corpus and then generate the samples of the target aware samples all together within this multi-source context and then train a single system and treat this multiple source as one source corpus. Uh, once that's trained can be directly applied to, uh, to, to, the, uh, to the unsupervised unlabeled uh, testing data sets as in the data, another database and actually helps improve upon you know, uh, all the previous baseline methods. So again, uh, of course, in the future, we're gonna see you know, the natural question next time will be raised will be what corpus work better for what database, right? Now we already have a good mechanism to show that by using attention to weight sum all the source corpus, it actually helps. Now for each target corpus, maybe every kind of attention will be need for different uh, will be different for each source to that to that target. So that will be next sort of our next step. Okay, the last section I want to talk about on the usability, right? So we have the robustness uh, in terms of label robustness. I uh, want to make sure cross test unseen emotion classes can be done without retraining. In generalization, okay, we have two different domain, two different data sets. How can we leverage existing multiple source corpus? through augmentation strategy to augment data in the source corpus that's target aware and train a single speech emotion recognition system in this source corpus and directly apply there, okay? Using the augmentation strategy with a corpus aware attention, it actually helps. The last, bit, the last bit I wanna talk about is from the user side, the usability side, okay? Once this thing is being deployed, okay? A user may, you know, be, you know, uh, very sensitive about their privacy, 
Okay, so because these are speech based stuff, speech embeddings contains a lot of information. It contains not just emotion, it contains gender, it contains uh, speaker identity. Okay, all these sort of stuff. Uh, maybe a user don't want it to reveal their identity. Okay, they may just want to reveal their emotion because they've signed up for emotion service or vice versa, right? I may want to reveal my identity, but I don't want to reveal my emotion. Okay, how do we do a system, a representation learning so that we can take care of this privacy, flexible privacy protection issue? And of course, any, you know, this sort of uh, deep learning based method also uh, are, are, are vulnerable to to, 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 to a text, right? So uh, a simple gradient of text will make this system goes uh, uh, bad, okay? So how do we uh, find a strategy that actually can defend against variable kind of attacks, okay? Robust against different attacks, okay? I'll talk about each one of them uh, quickly, okay? So in a previous work, when people try to do uh, um, uh, this emotion uh, the privacy protection they use an adversarial representation learning technique it's a very simple technique it's a uh, uh, basically by you know say if you have a, uh, a gender or you put uh, say if you want to protect your uh, personal id speaker id you have a branch in your network that do recognition that do training for a speaker id but they take that gradient put a slap and minus sign on it so that you make the system aren't able to do that task okay so Using this approach, it becomes that attribute agnostic. So meaning that attribute will become protected. Okay, so you aren't able to read off the speaker identity from the representation. That's all the previous work that has done pretty much in this domain using sort of adversarial representation learning strategy to, to uh, address the privacy concern. But that kind of approach has issues, okay? What I think is the issue is every such attribute you wanna protect, you have to retrain this adversarial learning again. Okay, so if you want to protect gender, you do it in the uh, gender and then do a reversal there. If you want to do speaker ID, you do a reversal there. So what our idea previously, you know, uh, uh, proposed is we do a disentangled attribute aligned representation. Well, what does that mean? That means for a embeddings, okay, it has nodes, okay. If we can say, you know, node one to five uh, are only uh, uh, contains information about gender. Okay, node five to 10 contains information about emotion. Node, you know, 10 to 15 contains emotion about speaker identity. If we could let our node representation be aligned to the attribute along this node wise dimension, we can easily pick and choose which node to mask to be able to do flexible privacy protection. Okay, that's uh, our approach. And previously we have proposed a layer representation learning strategy to do uh, in, the, in the dropout fashion. In recent work, we propose a attention mechanism with a loss design. I'll, I'll talk about this uh, in a more detail. So again, okay, MSC Podcast is a, is a good databases for us to use because it has so many speakers, they have about 600 speakers and it also has emotion labels. So we can try to say, protect emotion identity from emotion recognition or protect emotion from speaker identi identification. Okay, so this is all our framework. So you can see that in the middle, it's actually an autoencoder. Okay, so the representation are, are in the middle. So uh, <clears throat> so this is a first, we have a, a VAE that's trained on a, on a speech. Okay, then we run two, we call the scoring machines. Okay, one is an emotion scoring machines. Another one say is a speaker identity scoring machines. We take these scoring machines to actually uh, generate the attention weight on the embeddings, okay. And then uh, do it in a way, okay, uh, to let us know which nodes are important for which task. Okay, so the feature scoring machines are essentially a way to generate uh, a weight that tells us which node is important for which task. Okay. Now we further introduce a loss that's going to be used when we learn this feature scoring machine. We call it attention penalty loss. So the reason why is this. Imagine you have this feature scoring machine tell us which nodes are important for emotion. Speaker identity tells us which nodes are important for identity, but they may overlap, okay? Maybe node Y is also important for emotion at the same time it's important for, uh, for, for identity. So what we need to do is to actually align them uh, 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 in a way that's disjoint. So we introduce this attention penalty loss that forces these two vectors. You can imagine these two are attention vectors 
these two vectors, their cosine distance to be as far as possible, right? So the similarity, the cosine similarity between these two attention weights has to be as close, uh, as, as dissimilar as possible. Okay, so that's, you know, similarity, similarity measure will be as small as possible, meaning these two uh, attention vectors need to be as far away as possible. So that enforces our feature scoring machine to pick out the node that's important in a way that's only important for emotion, not for ID. Okay, because once that's done, then we can actually pick and choose which nodes are important. Okay. All right, so uh, also we do a simple, uh, also another one is called a, a diversity loss. This is essentially a, a additive uh, margin of softmax loss. Actually, look at the embeddings, not the tension. The embeddings make these embeddings cluster in their own space. Okay, so again, creates an even more separation between these two different tasks. Okay, the emotion task and the speaker ID task. Okay, so finally, we train all these things together. This is a representation learning strategy. So our goal is to finally come up with a representation uh, that align the attribute along dimensions, you know, meaning we know it, which of the nodes are important for emotion only, which of the nodes are important for identity only, and that these whole frameworks are jointly trained with all these different losses. Okay. Then once you train this thing, right, once that's done, what you need to do is basically say, okay, now you know which nodes are important for identity. Now you know which important for speaker, uh, speaker, speaker recognition. In this case, say if you want to do a, 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 a speaker-free, right, speaker-free speech motion recognition or emotion-free uh, 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 speaker verification, you just need to mask those nodes. Okay. And then do the task, right? Once that representation learning is done, right? You disentangle, you make them attribute aligned, not given a test, the flexible. If you wanna protect emotion, mask the emotion. If you wanna protect ID, mask ID, okay? So again, these are our two different scenarios that we test, you know, speaker ID free, speech motion recognition, uh, emotion free, speaker verification, okay? So in this case, right, emotion identity free, we want ER to be high, we want emotional recognition to be high as well. And we compare to all different kind of baseline uh, methodology. A quick summary, uh, our, our approach achieves a very competitive performance, uh, uh, even improved in PPSV scenario uh, as compared to adversarial learning strategy. But adversarial learning strategy, you don't have a single network to do this. Every such attribute, you have to retrain this adversarial uh, machine. In our cases, once we know which nodes are important for which, in a downstream test, you just need to choose and mask. Okay, it provides a much better flexibility. Okay, so again, uh, we we think this approach is good. Uh, uh, it's very competitive uh, in all these uh, privacy protection mechanism. It provides the flexibility. Okay, uh, and then we just basically by designing different losses and it guides the learning of the representation learning to make sure each node are only responsible for certain attribute of of interest, then once that's done, okay, privacy protection can be flexible, okay, and it actually will also maintain the main task performance at the same time, really degrades the other task uh, performance. In this case, right, ER goes from five to six percent all the way to thirty-five percent. Okay, so that's a uh, and then the 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 four class uh, emotion recognition maintains at the relatively high uh, 50, 50 something percent accuracy. All right, last bit of the usability talk I want to talk about is the uh, attack. Okay, I call it vaccinating SCR. Okay, I'll talk about why we call this. Okay, so again, we know deep learning models are vulnerable to adversarial attacks, especially the gradient distortion, right? If you just uh, tap a little bit of known models to where the, the gradients moves and then that completely change the output, okay? And right now there are a few works, okay, uh, not a lot, but there are already several works in motion recognition that actually try to defend against this kind of attack, okay. And a lot of those approaches are based on augmentation strategy, okay. It's very simple, you know, if I'm worried about a particular, uh, particular attack, uh, particular grading attack, I just generate the samples uh, using those grading attacks, then train my system by seeing those attacks then become robust against that, okay? That's a very uh, common strategy of doing a, 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 a defend against a particular type of adversarial attacks. But again, of course, this thing will have issues, right? It means 
you are only guaranteed to be able to handle those attacks that are seen. Okay, you cannot handle the attacks that are unseen. Okay, or you will have not a very good uh, performance when you deal with the attacks that is actually not present. Okay, so in this case, we develop a self-supervised defense mechanism that actually explore the gradient distortion space directly. Okay, so that it can handle the unseen type of attack along with the seen type of attack. Okay, very simple concept, right? To be able to handle gradient distortion attack, you let your model learn based on those. How do you learn based on those? You learn either by augmenting that specific type of distortion or you let it to explore in a self-supervised manner within that gradient distortion space to create your model. So again, our, our approach is better on high vocab databases. I've, seen, I've talked about this, I won't, I won't go into detail. The model is pretty simple. The self-supervised augmentation strategy is basically taking your feature through some uh, feature encoder, and then within that encoder, explore the encoder's gradient space, find the adversarial uh, samples that maximize such distortion. Okay, now you generate that. Okay, now once that's generated, you, you train a purified network. Okay, right? You generate the, the distorted set by looking at uh, generating a distorted sample that, that give you the maximum distortion in the feature representation and take those samples and then say, I'm gonna come back to the original samples. So we learn a purified network. Okay, so purify the distortion back to the original clean space. And that thing, we, 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 uh, we use a transformer structure, okay, to uh, train that purified network. Right, again, can sanitize those things. Okay, then we also have this uh, uh, discriminator to make sure you know the thing that we uh, eventually generated are, are you know are clean up are as similar as the original sample as possible using this sort of uh, a discriminator type of approach. The feature extractor are used so that it can use it to do self supervised uh, feature encoded distortion uh, gradient space to explore that space. Okay. So again, once that's done, right, we call it LSSD. This is the total loss that we use it to generate uh, the, uh, the purifying network. Once this system are trained, it's iterative, right? You generate the, the bad samples, train your purified network, use discriminate, make sure it works well. Then you repeat generating another, uh, another set of uh, uh, samples through the purified network. And then again, iteratively, okay, until uh, this whole thing start to converge. Okay, then once that's done, you take this purified network, okay, uh, step it in front of your emotional recognition system. Okay, any system that, right, that's okay. So it basically sanitize all the original samples. Uh, the, the, the could be attacked samples or anything. It goes through this purified network. And then, uh, and then you take the purified, uh, purified sample to the SCR models. So again, here's our, our, our results, okay. Compared to a very recent work that uses again this augmentation strategy for seen type of a uh, uh, attack F FGSM attack and seen type of attack we call it PGD uh, uh, PGD type of attack. The each one has a different kind of uh, uh, parameters. Our SSD because in the adversarial this kind of adversarial training it requires the seen type right. So you actually need to train with a particular parameter to augment the data. Our is a self exploration in the feature in the feature distortion space. Okay, so some of the results we see right in the scene type, the baseline model or the current state only performs better on the low intensity attack. Okay, and when the SSD are approached, our performance even under the scene attacks when the intensity of adversarial attack increases. For the unseen adversarial attacks, if you see our model, it consistently outperforms the other one, of course, because the other one aren't trained for this thing. Ours also aren't trained for PGD, but ours are able to handle a more variable kinds of uh, variable kinds of uh, uh, distortion, uh, gradient distortion based attack, okay, with an overall uh, performance that maintains among almost 40% accuracy. And we also do a final little bit of analysis. Okay, uh, we can imagine this is a vaccine, right? Once you put it through your spectrogram, right? It's kind of robust against a variant type of a viruses that people are trying to use it to do distortion. So we use a very similar evaluation metric called protection efficacy, right? The, the percentage of wrongly sample uh, is R no protect, R protect indicate if you, if you once you protect it, what are the number of samples that actually 
become distorted. Okay, our no protect is when you have a sample not going through the purified network and under attacks, uh, how many of those samples are actually get re uh, reverted model? Okay, so these are a, 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 a metric that's heavily used in vaccination. So our, our model has a protection efficacy about, you know, 45 percent okay uh, of course it's nowhere near like bnt's or this vaccine there in the 90 percent right but ours about 45 percent 50 percent if you look at the recent state of the art their protection efficacy is about only about 20 percent okay and then our 40 percent is very consistent across all kinds of uh, uh, uh all kinds of attack okay uh, another thing is we see that you know uh, by applying this purified network for all samples you actually even correct some of the samples okay originally was incorrectly recognized now become correctly recognized uh, in our approach this SSID uh, has uh, able to correct about 20 percent of originally wrong samples uh, the baseline method of uh, gradient based uh, 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 protection mechanism uh, are able to you know correct about 15 percent you might wonder you know why would you correct right because I, I think the reason uh, is really because we're we're augmenting the space in the gradient distortion. So effectively, I think we are augmented a whole feature distribution. And that actually makes our model more robust. So that robustness aren't only used to protect uh, the malicious attack, it actually able to make our original SCR model actually even more robust. Okay, so again, uh, the previous method corrects about 15%, our method can correct almost 20%. On the malicious, malicious attack protection efficacy, ours uh, is about 45%. The previous method is about 20, 20%. So we reduce about 50, 45% of the risk of getting our model incorrect results when under attack. The previous method, you know, about 20% reduced risk of changing their labels when under attack. So we are about two folds of uh, improvement. Okay, so let me do a quick summary uh, for, for today's talk. Again, I talk about quite a few things, many of them sort of glance to them, but hopefully it, it provides an overview on what I think as we starting to take this emotion AI technology into life. What are some of the key technical modeling challenges given the new era of deep learning, right? So what are some of the approaches, uh, some of the proper definitions uh, in terms of emotion recognition? In terms of robustness, you know, today we really talk about the label variability. But of course, there's always signal heterogeneity as well. Every device is collected data a different way. Every speech device is collected a different way. How do we make sure all of them give you the similar results? Okay, that's also under very important. The label uh, is the thing we talk about today. Generalization, right? Cross domain generalization, cross context label definition. In A to B databases, they are often collected in different contexts. One may be in healthcare, another one may be in educational setting. One may be in Chinese, one may be in English, uh, maybe one is another language that you guys are speaking, right? So every single one that creates a different cross-context scenario. How do we do it in a way, okay, that can be generalizable and easily generalizable, uh, not to have to do a lot of re-annotation. And the last bit are very important is nowadays our usability, okay? Taking this system, let the user use it, we quickly see there's some vulnerability of this kind of deep learning-based system. Uh, one is on ethics, fairness, uh, privacy issues, right? Another one is on attacks, right? So how do we make sure when a system are actually de developed or deployed in the real world, okay, when a user are using the system, what are some of the modeling things we can de develop to actually handle all these continuing issues? And of course, I could say this kind of ethic, fairness, privacy, attacks, you know, this kind of trustworthy emotion AI are becoming a center of focus for a lot of recent research around uh, uh, emotion recognition. And in fact, I just want to show this. This is Scientific America. They have a, ser it's, uh, a series uh, in, I think, English, also in, in Chinese as well. They talk about emotion recognition where a, a journalist uh, aren't happy about the way we're using it. Right? Tech, tech companies are now use AI to analyze your feeling in jobs. But the software is prone to racial, cultural, and gender bias. And then the Science of America approaches me because they you know I'm doing this kind of work. Ask me my take on this. I write another uh, another paper uh, for magazines, but this is not academic research for a magazine. I say, okay, a machine can be trained to recognize emotion by sensory data, but it needs a careful consider of the situation, social, technological aspect. Oh, right? well, we're not saying. Well, we're aware these are the issue. Okay, let us have some time to solve this issue, right? So, having solving this issue, I still believe that I think speech uh, uh, computing techniques will have a positive role 
in a lot of the uh, user application. And then what we need is more and more people's feedback, user feedback, telling us where you don't like it, right? If you don't like it to reveal your sensitive emotion, tell us. We design an algorithm that actually help you address that, okay? Uh, and we shouldn't be, you know, just directly say, okay, this is not good, let's, let's, let's kill it, right? So, uh, but I, I guess, you know, uh, there's, there's good and bad about this uh, uh, emotion recognition techniques. Uh, as it moves forward, I think as a, engineers and AI developer, we're starting to address this issue to make sure our athletic computing technology being deployed in a way that's responsible, uh, deployed in a way that's trustworthy, and those are very key issues as we move forward. That's my take. And, and thank you for, uh, again, uh, the, the invitation. Uh, open up for the floor if you have any questions for me. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, any, any questions from the floor? Uh, I think you you touch actually three interesting and uh, important problems in the field. While listening actually for the robustness, I understand that actually you uh, you are using some somehow actually a supervised uh, uh, model as a feature extractor to introduce actually new uh, emotions in few shot learning setup. Uh, can, I mean, did you consider, for example, doing the same thing in an unsupervised learning fashion? Uh, that is, I don't know. I mean, I, I see from time to time approaches targeting that direction, but uh, would it be possible to, uh, I mean, to collect maybe uh, emotionally variable larger samples of content so that an unsupervised uh, learner can can learn actually embeddings for few shot learning approaches. Yeah, that's a very good 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 suggestion. I, I, I think my take on that right now is it's very hard to do purely and supervise uh, because I, I think you know because we're we're in our methodology in the end, what we need is just do feature extraction and dot product, right? So that means that feature extractor itself needs to be very, very well trained. Okay, very, very well trained. So, so what that means, you know, uh, when we actually build upon this four basic emotion category, our major assumption there is once that's supervised well, that feature extractor represents a good spectrum of the space, of the emotion space. Okay, so if you wanna do it purely and supervised, I'm afraid this kind of discrimination will become very difficult because the embeddings now can contain other information beyond uh, emotion. Yeah. Uh, what I think uh, 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 recent work I've seen other people are doing is basically instead of using this kind of hard supervised or uh, hard and supervised, they do it in the middle, they call it weekly supervised. You know? weekly supervised. Yeah, they, they do it kind of a, a unsupervised manner of deriving metric that's very uh, emotion related. Okay, so that, that way you don't have to have labels, but you know the thing that you're learning on are actually very emotion related. Say for example, if you wanna do, uh, you can do one of the tasks will be you know, a, a pitch race. Okay, you know this is emotion related, but you don't have, need to have labels to help you do that. Okay, then you can train a system that way and then hopefully that build a very a grounded space to, to be able to do uh, you know, handling different task definition. But I think that's a promising approach. I haven't personally tried it, but I, I think it's very exciting. Yeah. And also for the cross, I mean, cross corpus testing setup for the generalization work that you did, mm -hmm. it is really interesting to see that the basically performance of the balance is improved, uh, although it is often actually a hard task to, to attack. Uh, mm -hmm. Over there, actually, did you uh, did you test only on one of the target data sets? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it, is that characteristic actually consistent if you shuffle the data sets? Mm -hmm. uh, we haven't done all the combinations, but um, my, our feeling is that the balance improved in this context is, is consistent, okay? It's consistent. And I think that consistency uh, is because of the use of game, I feel oh. like. Okay, so I, I think if you've seen in the literature, uh, not even not in the cross corpus setting, even within corpus setting, you know, like for a particular database, if you want to augment that database is using a game-like generative model, you see a direct improvement in the valence as well. So 
so I think uh, there is something in, in that generative model that helps exploring the space that actually makes the system more robust toward the uh, balance. And of course, in a cross context, if you use that as a way to do a generation of the samples, I think that helps as well. So my feeling is, is that. So that's as a consistent finding we, we do it. But of course, you know, we haven't done this all shuffling, but I, I would imagine it would be very similar. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, any any other questions from the floor? Okay, then uh, let me thank you again, Jeremy. Hope no, to no. see you soon in in <laughs> one of the conferences face to face. <laughs> yes, thank you, thank you, thank you for the invitation again. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye.